PSC, there's a, uh, uh, there's a graphic here on screen, right? Can everybody see a uh, handsome-looking artist drawing at a drawing board here? Yep, yep, yep. Okay. Well, interestingly enough, that is my father. <laughs> that is a caricature that my father did of himself back in, I think, oh, the date is 1939. When he, too, aspired to be a cartoonist, what it says at the bottom there is artist, lover, and uh, inventor. So uh, aside from inventor, uh, that's, uh, that's what I wanted to be. <laughs> you know, what, what's funny to me is I now have that wardrobe. I've got the bow ties and the, um, uh, you know, the cuff pants and all that. Uh, anyway, that's, um, that's how far back uh, things go. Um, my father ran an advertising agency in the, uh, in the 50s and 60s. Have any of you seen the series Mad Men? Uh, very popular here in the United States, and uh, it's about an ad agency back then. And um, it was exactly like that. And um, so uh, what, what's interesting to me watching a show like that is, is seeing what has changed. What I notice is that ad agency probably has 30 people in it, as my father's ad, ad agency did. And um, because of technological advances, that agency would probably be five people today. Uh, with everything else done through um, uh, through technology, so um, that's my history. Uh, let's see. I'm getting Yasmin here. Interested in animation, script writing? Great. You are in the right place here. Okay. So I'm just going to go ahead. What I'm going to do is go through this slideshow. This is kind of a bio of me, and uh, we've got plenty of time here. We'll take about half the webinar for this. Uh, we got about an hour here for anybody who can stay that long, and then I'll take questions from you. Okay. Um, what I'm going to say to begin with is, uh, if you don't know, we have two courses here. They're very compact. Uh, they're in two sessions per week each for um, over the course of a month. And one is script writing for animation, and one is animation pitch bibles. So we kind of broke these out over um, from a larger three-month course, which we'd like to do. But these are uh, very, com very complete um, and precise and in script writing for animation, what we're going to do is you will come out of that with a sample uh, sample script, and in animation pitch bibles, you'll come out with a brief bible, uh, meaning what you use to uh, present an original project. So, what I would say here is, is that if you aspire to work in animation, certainly you want to write uh, write scripts if you can. Um, so that's what the one course is for, and eventually. I think that anybody working in animation, believe me, whether you're technically involved or creatively involved, at one point you're probably going to want to pitch your own show. You're going to say, I want to see my project on the air. And that's what the pitch bibles are. <coughs> Excuse me, glass of water here. So uh, one or both of these is um, what we're, we're aiming for here. And we're aiming, uh, I think, you know, Mario will agree with this. To bring in, yeah, not, you like this? <laughs> Everything in my house is cartoony, so uh, my poor wife has to put up with that, but it's very elegant. <laughs> so, um, we, um, we have one more week uh, in which you can sign up uh, for uh, these courses online, um, so uh, you guys can uh, get in under the wire on this, all right? And um, so, any questions about that, we'll get into that later on. So uh, let's do a little more uh, slideshow here, okay? Um, so let's get to me. Ah, um, so after some adventures being a commercial artist, I started um, in animation. I And, and this, this really helped. I'm going to give you some advice here. I joined in um, the late 70s. That's how long ago. I joined an organization called the Comic Art Professional Society. And I recommend joining any organizations, groups, when you're young, because that's the way you, you meet your fellow, you meet your colleagues, uh, you get encouragement, and you also get assignments. Um, I met a fellow who is uh, who I consider my mentor, a fellow named Mark Evanier. He was actually younger than me, but he was the editor for the Hanna-Barbera comic books, which were published, as you see, through Marvel. And he had a lot of these comic books to turn out and uh, hired me as one of his writers. So uh, this is this is the first one that I got that I actually got a written by credit for. It's it's in there somewhere. <laughs> oh, I know Mario will be uh, proud of me if I can uh, activate the, um, uh, the pointer here. So let's see if I can do that. Did I do that? Oh. 
well, I don't know if you can see it, but anyway, one the, at one point there it says "Story by Jack Enyart," so I was pretty proud of that. And I turned out a lot of these. Uh, and, and I will tell you that comic books, although there's not much money in it right now, comic books was my favorite medium because basically I wrote the story, turned it into the editor, and a few months later it came back drawn. And <laughs> the nice thing was by that time I'd forgotten what I had written, so. I'd open the comic book and I'd be able to laugh and enjoy my own stuff <laughs> and say, hey, that was pretty good. So the lag time there was very good. But there, there are fewer um, interferences, uh, um, shall we say. Oh, I see the pointer here. There it is. Now, how do I move the thing? Ah, there we go. Yeah, so there's the green pointer. It says, story by Jack Inner. Okay. So now we've got a pointer and we know we've got that. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay, so I go and grab it. Um, so let me see, that is slide, is that slide seven? Yeah, okay. And for eight, ah, so, um, <clears throat> I was uh, then contacted by, um, a company that did, um, the Warner Brothers and Disney comics. It was called Western Publishing and it was in, in business for a lot of years. This, this will, this will show you how long ago this is. Let me pick up this pointer if I can. Look at the price here, 40 cents for a comic book. <laughs> and, and how long ago this is, is <laughs> I don't know if they even make waterbeds anymore, but this is a waterbed gag with Daffy Duck. But um, one of the problems with comic books these days is that they're, they're as expensive, or they're almost as expensive as a regular magazine, but magazines are so expensive that the newsstands don't want to carry them because they can make more money selling a copy of, you know, Vogue or, uh, you know, whatever... Uh, Know, whatever big thumping magazines there are, so it's not worthwhile for them to carry comic books. So you buy comic books now in um, in comic book stores, and even in Los Angeles, you know, big city here, there's maybe I don't know less than a half a dozen comic book stores. So you've really got to be dedicated, and you've got to go into them. Another problem, and this is an interesting one, is that because the stores are specialty places, um, they're perceived as places where teenage boys go. So adults don't go, women don't go, <laughs> uh, whereas, in, as I say, in, in the olden days, I used to be able to go into uh, the drugstore, the supermarket, and buy a comic. So what that kind of brings up here is, is as you'll see, uh, in this course, we're not just, just going to be learn, learning about creativity. There's going to be some business in this and um, some learning how to market yourself, okay? Uh, let's see. Oh, I see. Mar Mario is talking um, online here. Good. I'm glad to have Mario here. It makes me feel uh, like I got uh, got back up. Okay, slide nine here. <laughs> Just another page of that comic book. This is a, one of my favorite stories. Um, I had um, I had Daffy Duck um, flip a coin. You know, only Elmer Fudd would do this. Flip a coin in which you know he heads you win, tails you lose kind of thing. And Daffy won and won everything that Elmer owns: his house, his wardrobe, all, all of that. <laughs> And, uh, of course, it was a two-headed coin, which we find out at the end. But what I always wanted to show was uh, Elmer Fudd's wardrobe, which, as you see down in the corner here, is, you know, the same suit and the same bowler hat over and over and over again. This is one of the things about the old-fashioned comic book characters. I always wondered, did they have just one outfit, or was it the same outfit, you know, over and over again? So this is the kind of thing that, um, you know, is important. Okay, uh, slide number 10, what do we got here? Oh, I think I maybe I hit the. Uh, oop, nope. Now, see, I have to move this tricky pointer. Why am I not getting a slide? Hmm. Oh, there is no slide ten. Okay, here we go. Ah, here we go. Um, now, for, um, here's career connections. Having written Warner Brothers comic books, one day I called up the Warner Brothers Animation Studio. And I just happened to uh, uh, catch it at a time when they were looking to bring in a young writer. So you never know. You just never know where, what, um, you know, what the uh, right um, moment is going to be. So they brought me in and um, I did, among other things, um, publicity. So this was um, a uh, publicity piece for um, a, uh, a Looney Tunes special, and we decided to do a newspaper. And uh, the Looney Tunes special, the big deal about it was that uh, it was going to be a Roadrunner cartoon where the coyote finally catches the Roadrunner. So that's our um, that's our headline here. 
By the way, the way that cartoon panned out was the coyote did catch the roadrunner, but the roadrunner had been blown up to giant size, and so the coyote could do nothing with him. <laughs> well, Mario is just carrying on his own little conversation here with the guests, so uh, I hope you're paying attention to me, too. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, so uh, from... Um, uh, let's see, from Warner Brothers Studios, I went to a studio called Ruby Spears Productions, and um, the major uh, thing that everybody remembers that they did was uh, Alvin and the Chipmunks. You all remember that, I, uh, I hope. And uh, I did, and this is an example of a storyboard for a script I wrote. So the process is, you write a script, and then it goes to the, uh, bo um, uh, to the um, art department where the, uh, the boards uh, do. What, the 3D Alvin movie? Oh my lord. I hate 3D. See? See my glasses here? I'm not going to put on another pair of big glasses over these. <laughs> and this, is, uh, this really is a, uh, um, an issue for people of a certain age and or, uh, you know, problematic vision is that uh, 3D hurts your eyes. Um, anyway, so, um, so this was a storyboard. <laughs> um, uh, Alvin started a babysitting service, and I got to be a specialist in titles. The other... Um, uh, the other uh, Writers would come to me, and uh, so I called it a rash of babies. And I actually got a call from uh, the uh, from the accounting department. They were issuing the check to pay me for this, and the accountant said, "Jack, we want you to know that we in the accounting department think this is a really funny title." <laughs> so, uh, let's see here. So, now uh, let me tell you something interesting about about writing. I wrote Alvin and the, you're you're all familiar with it, and I wrote Alvin and the Chipmunks for years before I realized because somebody mentioned it to me, that I was actually writing about myself and my brothers. I have two brothers, and it's very clear that my middle brother is Alvin, the youngest brother is Theodore, and I'm the oldest one, um, you know, uh, Simon here with the, uh, you know, see Simon with the glasses? Oh, well, that's me. I was the oldest sensible one. <laughs> so, um, let's see, we're on 13 here? Yes, yeah, so we might go to 13. Ah! Okay, now here's where we're getting into creativity and animation Bibles and that sort of thing. Um, at a certain point, as I say, I think you're going to want um, you're going to want to create your own project, and there is a lot of work in development in animation. And uh, development in animation is very similar to uh, how it's done in um, in live action. Um, a lot of work is done that never sees the light of day and that you can be paid very well to do. There are writers in Hollywood who have never had a movie or a television show produced, and yet they've made very good livings of things that were pitched and presented, you know, and developed to a certain point, and nobody ever saw them. Um, anyway, I had a, uh, I had a, a very um, uh, treasured associate, a fellow named Sam Ewing, just one of those guys you really liked working for, and he was really enthusiastic and all that. And he, worked, he was a development executive for Hanna-Barbera Productions, which um, you must know the name. And uh, he said, Jack, bring me in something. And I got the craziest idea. This was a couple decades ago. But I had an idea about a young, uh, you know, kind of preppy kid who would be haunted by hippies from the 60s. And so I created this thing called Zack and the Flashbacks. And here's how we did it. Um, I hired an artist friend to do the cover here. And basically, uh, Sam and I agreed that if I gave him a development of about 20 pages, that he would give me an answer on this. He said, that will be enough for me to decide whether we'll give you a development deal on this or not. And as I say, um, you know, there, there is my, my father, who you saw at the beginning here, said, there's no substitute for doing business with honorable people. And Sam was on, was and is an honorable guy. And so I went away, and I wrote the 20 best pages I could as a presentation, and I brought it in. He said, I like it. Here's a development deal. So the deal was they paid me over a period of several months to develop this further. And we did a big presentation for um, uh, Zach and the Flashbacks, complete with artwork. We had musicians lined up for it. And um, during the course of that, because I was in and out of the studio, they also gave me other development projects. And unbeknownst to them, they gave me the same deal on the other projects. They just duplicated the paperwork. 
which meant that if these other projects would they'd come up with and which I had worked on had been bought and gone into production I would have had some ownership in it and I noticed this and I mentioned this to my agent at the time and the agent said shh don't tell them <laughs> so the moral of this story is I wrote um, I did three separate developments. This was um, done very elaborately. And for some reason, they never showed it to the network. It went into the drawer. So, you know, Hanna Barbera. So, and at, oh, and at a certain point, the rights reverted back to me. So, as I say, the moral of this is that, you know, if you don't find this demoralizing, um, you know, you can, you can do considerable work on projects, get paid for, but it, it's not necessarily going to be produced. There's, there's a lot of. Um, um, work done in Hollywood that is speculative, but you want it to be speculative that you're paid for, if that's possible. Okay, so um, let's see what else we got here. Oh, good, we got more to come. By the way, if you have any questions about all this, you know, save it and we'll, uh, we'll get into this, okay? So, slide 14. Ah, yes, yes. So, one of my favorite projects was they uh, um how many of you remember uh, Roger Rabbit? The Roger Rabbit movie. Boy, I hope so. Um, that was very important. It really brought back feature animation. And there was a lot riding on that film. If it hadn't succeeded, I'm not so sure we'd have animated features here today. But Steven Spielberg uh, put it together. And he was probably the only one in Hollywood who could get all the studios to cooperate so that all the animation characters could appear in, um, uh, could appear in it. Uh, the big deal was getting the Warner Brothers characters and the Disney characters. And since Spielberg managed to do that, uh, he got the movie off the ground. Um, but again, um, I managed to get uh, into, the, um, uh, into the comic book project for Roger Rabbit. And um, comic books at the major studios are handled through a, um, a division called Consumer Products. So make note of that. Consumer Products is everything, just about everything except the original entertainment product. In other words, if there's a movie like Aladdin, let's see, have we got Aladdin here? Uh, yes, here's Aladdin right behind me, <laughs> the comic book version. Um, if they produce Aladdin, the movie, they also produce the comic books, the mugs, the, the toys, uh, you know, the video game, all that. All of that is in the consumer products department. So there's a lot of work and a lot of creativity possible in the consumer, yes, merchandising, Mario's writing here. Uh, derivatives, yes, other words for this, yeah. It's a big, big world there, and sometimes you can be cre very creative. Uh, in the case of Roger Rabbit, like with the w w Warner Brothers characters, they were great characters, and then they gave them to me to create more, uh, more stories with. This, this one was one of my favorite. I, sa um, I said to the, uh, the editor, said, uh, what character do you really want to work with? And I said, I really want to work with Jessica Rabbit. <laughs> and the reason I did was, I'll tell you, again, you know, you pull things from your own life. My aunt was a very famous exotic dancer. I mean, stripper. And she was very much like Jessica Rabbit. And so I wrote Jessica very much with kind of my aunt's personality, and I got stories from my aunt to uh, um, uh, to put in this. So, listen. Despite the fact that you're working in cartoons, you got to bring in real good stuff from your life because these characters symbolize real life experiences in an exaggerated form. Okay. Uh, anyway, so so this story, this was one of one of my favorites, and it worked out really well. Is uh, Beauty on the Spot, and I figured that. Jessica would have won the beauty contest in Toontown every single year. So finally this year she retires and becomes a judge. But what that means is she's under pressure from every other woman in Toontown um, you know, to, uh, um, who, who wants to be the new queen. So I got to create all these crazy you know, female characters in, in Toontown. So um, that, that's the thing about stories. Sometimes you, you create a story to give you a framework to do something you want to do. And what I wanted to do here was um, fantasize about, you know, what all the other females in, in, Toon, in, in Toontown were who would think that they were beauty queens. And the format gave me the chance to do that. Oh, Lucas has to leave. Where are you going? <laughs> Better be good. <laughs> okay, let's see here. Ah, now here's a, here's a lesson for us all. Um, 
Next, I went to um, Marvel Production. Oh, going out with your sister. Well, say hi to the sister. Okay. Um, I next went to uh, Marvel Productions, and um, I worked on uh, the uh, the uh, let's see the animated version of Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. I don't know if you have ever seen these movies, but uh, they were very cheaply done. They were like parodies of horror movies, and uh, my fellow writers and I looked at this and we thought, what can we do? And we just decided to make the screwiest parody of sci-fi movies that we could on Saturday morning. So we just threw everything at the wall with this thing. There were, uh, you know, we bent the rules. We 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 had characters speak to the camera. Um, you see the um, uh, little character here, um, Chad, um, is the uh, little boy who was the he hero sort of of the show. He ran around on a skateboard, and um, because we had problems sometimes, you're welcome, Lucas. Yeah. Uh, because we had problems sometimes with the censors who would tell us what we could and could not do in terms of violence and all that on the show, we thought, well, we'll show them. So we created a character called the Censor Lady, and she looked like an old-fashioned librarian, you know, with a ruler and all that. And she'd come on the show, you know, without warning to tell us that we couldn't do something. And at one point she said, well, uh, Chad can't be on a skateboard without a, without a seatbelt. So we had Chad lying on the skateboard with a seatbelt on, you know, trying to get around town. Um, so, anyway, the interesting thing was the actual censor lady liked her character so much and was so flattered by this that she eased off a bit. <laughs> so, um, maybe the moral of that is, you know, the, the point is, here's what the moral of this is. When you're writing, you're going to be paid for your creativity. It's better to be a little outrageous and then give the executives the chance to pull you back. And then they think, well, we've done it, we've tamed him or whatever, but I would err on the side of, of um, being daring and all that um, because that's what gets people to watch the shows and that's what leads them to believe that you're you know, a new up-and-coming wonderful talent and all. And as I say, the executives then give themselves credit for being able to you know, wrangle you and keep you in line. So um, I've played that myself a few times with their... There are some outrageous people in this business who've done nothing but, um, <laughs> to use the vernacular, done nothing but piss people off, and that's their style. Um, in particular, there's a guy named John Chris Felucci. You may know him. Uh, he created Ren and Stimpy and um, a couple of other things. And John just went from being fired from one thing to the next, and he always landed a little higher up the higher up the ladder. So. Uh, anyway, so here is the Killer Tomatoes coloring book, and so I was wandering through some sh um, you know drugstore one day or whatever, and there it is, big coloring book, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, and I open up this book and I realize that it's the pilot show that I wrote for Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, and um, so the lesson we want to take away from this is, guess how much I earned from this uh, coloring book? Nothing, <laughs> because... The writing that I'd done on the script was what is called work for hire. And if you ever look at a work for hire contract, and you will if you work on assignment, it will say that you don't own the rights to the characters, you're selling the rights to the story, blah, 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 blah. And that's what you do when you don't own the characters. So in this case, although there was a second, a second use of my story, I did not have rights to it. If there had been some kind of provision for the second, me to get a payment off of that, that would be different. Okay, so... Word, we're only 15, 16. I haven't looked at this slideshow in a while. It's, um, um, I don't have too many recent things on it because this is from a while ago, but um, I promise that in the classes we're going to get into some recent projects that I've done that are interesting. But this is, uh, as I say, just a way, you know, a biography uh, sort of so you know what I'm about. Oh my gosh, Siegfried and Roy. Yeah, remember Siegfried and Roy, the magicians? Um, again, this was another series, another project. I worked on it at Marvel. They were going to do a cartoon show about Siegfried and Roy, you know, <laughs> mag magicians on Saturday morning. And again, this was a project that we worked on. This project was at three different studios. It was at one studio, and then the development lapsed, or the executive who had it moved to another studio, and I went to another studio after that. I spent a lot of time working on Siegfried and Roy, and here was a, here was a perk. At one point, they flew all the writers and our wives to Las Vegas to see the show. And it was great. <laughs> it, it was this great. So we go into the big showroom for Siegfried and Royal. Like, yeah, Vegas, baby, Vegas. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so we go into the big showroom and they seat us at a big front table, okay? And the show's about to start and this guy comes in and he looks just like a character on The Sopranos, you know, double-breasted suit and the slick back hair. And he leans over our table to the writers and their wives. He says, if there's anything you want, I mean anything, you tell me. <laughs> We couldn't think of anything. <laughs> so we just saw the show. So that was my adventure with Siegfried and Roy. But I may have something here. Oh, this is great. So so because I never got a chance to actually do the animated show, I never went on the air, I just got obsessed with Siegfried and Roy. And what I did was I put them in all the comic books I was working on. So here, take a look at this. This is an Aladdin comic book, which here's Aladdin up here, which I wrote for Disney. And um, I had uh, the genie put on a show at, at the palace, and he split himself in two to be Sigmund and Oi, okay, down at the bottom in here. So that was my Sigmund and, and Roy, I mean, uh, Siegfried and Roy um, parody. And I still hadn't gotten it out of my system, so in the Warner Brothers comic book, I uh, had Elmer Fudd in a wig and Yosemite Sam uh, appear as Elmer and Sam magicians, right? Okay. Oh, and by the way, this uh, lovely redhead up in up in the corner here—that's a uh, caricature of my wife. I thought, you know, that's another thing. You you know, you you put your friends in the comics every so often if you can, just for fun. <laughs> All right, let's see. Nineteen. Oh, we're rolling along here. Ah, so um, <clears throat> I think we're yeah we're up to the '90s here. Now you saw the original the uh, the first Daffy Duck book. Um, uh, with the waterbed and all that. Um, they revived the Looney Tunes comic books in uh, the 90s, and they were determined, in, in, in the wake of Roger Rabbit and um, getting Steven Spielberg into uh, the Warner Studio to work on, on new things, uh, they, they were determined to up the quality of the books. As you'll see, this is a much more sophisticated cover. The drawing is, is um, uh, more polished, too. And these were really good um, comics, and it gave me my second go-round with these characters. They brought me in because I had worked on them before, but I also managed to uh, convince them that um, you know I could do <coughs> I could do a good job the second time around. So um, you need to remarket yourself every so often. You know? And boy, was that great because I had a bunch of leftover story ideas that I hadn't been able to use the first time around, and this time it was like I tried them all over again. And uh, Gone through. So never throw anything away. Also, I um <clears throat> I would occasionally have story ideas and they get rejected for a character. Like I, I you know I tried for uh, for a long time for Disney to try to um, sell Mickey Mouse comic stories and they rejected every one. And it wasn't me. I'm convinced of that. It's just that Disney was so protective of Mickey Mouse at the time they just couldn't decide what you know what they wanted him to do. So every time a Mickey Mouse story was rejected, I turned it into a Woody Woodpecker story because the characters were so similar uh, in, in comic book terms. They both had nephews and all that. Um, oh, Mario sa has a question here. All right, I'll have an interrupt. How long to write a comic? That's interesting because um, uh, uh, the comic book stories I was writing were uh, the first ones were about six pages long. Uh, these ones were longer. But when I was writing six-page um, uh, six stories, I could probably turn one out in a day or two, and I was under a contract to turn them out, so I was turning in, turning out something like like three stories a week, you know, and there was kind of a rhythm to it. Um, my big question was where where all the ideas were going to come from, and uh, they they kind of turned into a diary um, because I figured, well, you know, if Bugs Bunny if I went to the bank one day and I had a bad time, then Bugs Bunny would walk into the bank and he'd have a bad time. So uh, that was one way of, of getting ideas. Um, these stories, um, these new Looney Tunes stories here, were, were different lengths. They had a short length of about six pages. There was ten pages, and then you'd do a really grand book, and it would be the whole book, and it would be like 18 or 20-something uh, pages. So that would take longer. That would take um, maybe a week. Yeah, three stories a week, yeah. But they were short, you know. So I said the way... The way I had to figure out how to do it was to just say, well, it's an incident, you know. And usually, as I say about the bank, if something really teed me off, then I'd write a story about it and get it out of my system, yeah. So, but, it, you know, it, it's funny. It's a matter of rhythm. Um, I will tell you that I'm finding it harder to work now because almost everything I'm working on is so different. It, it's harder to um, switch gears with projects, and I have to trap myself. Um, you know, thanks to computers... Uh, I do a lot of my work in coffee houses, 
because I take my laptop computer and my iPad, which I'm learning how to use, and go out and I say, look, I'm going to be here for two hours and I can't do anything else. I can't get distracted because I'm not going to go online. I'm not going to start rearranging the office and all that. So I, I find the only way to work is to um, uh, you know, set aside time and, and, and deliberate space for it. Um, oh, Shifa says, did you write them and then make a storyboard? Well, in, in the case of the comic books, um, most of them I wrote were in script form. Some of them I did rough storyboards for and would send that along. Um, when I was doing this, and, and I'll, I'll show you anime, I'll show you um, uh, comic book scripts as well as uh, animation writing scripts in, in class. But in this case, I would do a very detailed script, dialogue, descriptions of what happens in the panels, and then diagrams of the panels, um, you know, showing that... Uh, you know, the first page would probably have one large panel and two small ones and, you know, all that. So the layouts would come. Uh, what's uh, script form? Let's see. Shifa is typing. Let's see what Shifa says. Yes. Well, I don't have it to pull up right here, but you'll get it in class. <laughs> As a matter of fact, everybody's going to get formats because um, that... If you get nothing else out of these classes, what you need to know is formats because in Hollywood, in presenting projects, that's the first thing they do to winnow things out and reject things so that they don't have to deal with them is that, well, this isn't in the right format. Don't look at it. So uh, that, that's your basic way of getting past the gatekeeper. And um, it, uh, you know, w once you see it and once you have a template for it, it's, um, you know, it's, it's pretty simple. But, um, you know, just use the proper format and, uh, and proof it for spellings and all that. That's the first thing. Yeah. Okay. So, slide 20. What is this? Ah, yes, yes. So, um, <clears throat> these comic book stories, um, the, these later ones for uh, Warner Brothers, were published all over the world. This is an Australian comic. And it's in a big format. It's considerably larger than another comic book. And it's got all sorts of prizes and stickers and all these things in it. Look, here's a, you know very highly rendered Bugs Bunny, and we've got Looney Tunes mugs for sale and all that. This is Australian edition. So, um, so I wrote, I wrote many scripts um, for stories that were only published overseas, and therefore they went overseas and they were translated before they were drawn. And one of the things I wondered, yeah, isn't that great? Yeah, we had some great artists working on these later books. And, um, I, I wondered sometimes if I was uh, funny in other languages. I was traveling through Europe, and, and um, I was in Italy, and I walked into a store, and there was the cover of a book that I recognized that I'd written. It was a Looney Tunes book, and oh, so I bought it, and it's in Italian. And uh, I brought it home, and I found somebody I knew who spoke Italian, and I had her sit in front of me while she read it to see if she laughed, and she laughed at certain places, so I thought, oh, okay, that's good. <clears throat> Here's something interesting. When I was writing these books and they were telling and they were telling me the stories we could do, I loved writing for the European market because I could do parodies of great books and um, you know I did some very worldly things because it was considered that European children and young people were more educated than Americans were. And when I was trying to sell American stories, they said they're only interested in in, in cars and and baseball and and, and that which I thought was really dumbing things down a bit, but at least for the European books, I got a chance to do, you know, parodies of big novels and things, and uh, Greek myths and <laughs> all sorts of things. Ah. <laughs> Here's one of my favorite stories about, you know, having fun in the business and getting a little revenge and all that. Um, I don't know if you remember the movie Space Jam. But uh, I found that students in classes I've done um, really liked the movie. It was um, uh, Michael Jordan and the, uh, and the Looney Tunes characters. And uh, I was writing um, Looney Tunes comic books at the time the movie was being done. And so I suggested um, to somebody just in passing that we do a, um, a graphic novel version to come out with the movie. You know, get the two departments working together, the publishing department and the, um, uh, and the um, uh, movie department. And I got this letter from a lady lawyer, okay, and she says, she a Warner Brothers lawyer and all that, and she says, you do not own the rights to these characters, and you cannot negotiate, and blah, 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 and everything like that, and I get to the end of this letter, I thought, what is this, you know, and I suddenly realize 
this is some gal probably just out of Harvard or what? Oh, she signs herself, you know, uh, Susie Smith or whatever, Esquire, which, you know, I've never heard of a female Esquire. Uh, Bugs Bunny used to have a, a sign outside his whole Bugs Bunny Esquire, you know, but it's an honorific for men. So very strange. Anyway, so I wrote back to her and I said, look, I said, you know, I'm assuming she's younger than I am. So sometimes you, sometimes you pull the age card. And I said, I've been working for Warner Brothers for 20 years. I know very well that I don't own Daffy Duck. And I said, you're lucky this came to me. Because if you'd sent this kind of a letter to somebody like Chuck Jones or Frizz Feeling, you know, one of the guys who was like 100 years old who originally created these characters, they would have raised such hell. They would have gotten her fired. I said, you don't treat the creative people this way. It's impolite. I, I didn't say it quite like that, but I really, you know, came back at her. And, um, but I still stewed about this. I thought, where does she get off? So for Looney Tunes, I did this story about Daffy, about Daffy Duck. And um, Warner Brothers, in the story, Warner Brothers is going to make a, uh, a movie of Daffy Duck's life. But Daffy looks at his contract and he realizes he doesn't own the rights to himself. And Warner thinks he's too difficult to work with. So any, they want anybody but Daffy to play Daffy Duck. So, and the publishing department, Consumer Products, loved this story. They gave me most of the comic book for it and they kept expanding it and they wanted all the characters in it and everything. So, and... This, this cover is as best I could want. They've got Daffy in a straight jacket. And the, on the buckles and, and the straps, it says, Property of Warner Brothers Legal Department. I mean, I couldn't ask for better revenge, right? Yeah. <laughs> so you get these satisfactions. <laughs> you know. And so the, mor the moral of this is, is don't get the artists and writers mad. <laughs> and um, here's another payoff from this book. Uh, I, hope you can, I hope you can see this well on your screens, uh, if you can come in close to this. So, as I say, one of the reasons for writing this story, and they got it too, was we wanted to make it a big guest star story, you know, all the characters in it. There was a, a restaurant across the street from Warner Brothers, this um, dark, um, you know, red tablecloth Mexican restaurant called El Chiquito. And everybody would go there from Warner Brothers and sit there in the dark and drink margaritas and make deals with other studios. You know, it's where everybody went to conspire. So I put it in the story... And I called it Speedy Gonzalez's Mexican Cantina. And the artist, of course, knew all about this place. So it looks just like the restaurant. But what I made it was the place where all the one-shot characters hang out. See? So here's all the characters that was only in... See, in this first panel here. Here's all the characters that were on, in only one Warner Brothers cartoon. And they're all hanging out waiting for their best chance again. Uh, yeah, I thought everybody's typing in here how much they like this. Oh, boy, did I have a good time doing this. Um... So they're all waiting here, and Daffy looks at his contract, and there's X's on it, and he doesn't own anything. So Porky walks in at the bottom, and Porky says, hey, uh, the, they're holding open auditions at the studio across the street for the Daffy Duck movie, and everybody charges out of the restaurant, flattening Daffy Duck. So, uh, yeah, we can all relate here. So, okay. Yeah, it was fun. Let's see. Okay, we've got a few more slides to go. I hope you're having fun here. And, uh, yeah, we'll have plenty of time for, um, for questions. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, here's one of my favorite projects. I, I, um, my wife and I talked a lot about this. My wife's in the fashion industry, and um, it, it, became, it became a real problem with comic books. This was a few years ago now. That There were very few comic books for girls. It was all superheroes and all little kids stuff. And I really wanted to create a girls' comic book, you know. Um, and uh, what I did do was I managed to talk Marvel Comics into getting the option... Uh, on uh, the movie Clueless. Uh, I don't know how many of you, you know, girls and boys, have seen Clueless. Um, Peasworm. Who's Peasworm? <laughs> That's a great name. <laughs> um, uh, so they, they, they got the comic book rights to the Clueless movie, and I had a great time writing this. Um, so um, they published a couple of issues with this, and they didn't really follow up on it, but I just thought that, uh, I, I, I thought the next step would be a Clueless animated show. They still haven't done that. But uh, what I like here, hold on, I'm trying to get this, uh, what slide do I want there? 18, what was that? 20, oh, sorry, I jumped here. Oh, come back to this here. Here we go. Oh, yes. Um, so I wanted you to see the artwork. This is a uh, spread page, you know, two pages of a uh, clueless story. 
But what I was concerned with was that it didn't look like a Barbie comic book, you know, very conventional and all that. Oh, Yasmin. Oh, no. I'm sorry. Well, listen, I'm relieved that as many people as you can see it. Yasmin, take the class, okay? I'll run over all this again just for you. <laughs> okay. So we have... Um, so I was very pleased that they got this avant-garde looking art and, uh, you know, very stylized and, and it just, uh, it really made the project, I think. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, I, I want to back up a bit here because I noticed something. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, in the Warner Brothers comics. So I was telling you uh, that um, for overseas projects that um, we could do um, parodies of, of books and, uh, and, and films and things. And, and one of my favorite movies is made way back in the 1950s, Around the World in 80 Days. And so I did uh, a Bugs Bunny story, Around the World with 80 Carrots, where um, Phileas Fudd, you know, Elmer Fudd, uh, makes a bet to go around the world, and uh, by golly, he finds uh, Bugs Bunny in his um, uh, in his balloon basket here. And uh, again, it was one of those stories where I just put every character in it, and I begged him for more pages. <laughs> uh, Training Cat says, "Wow, I knew about the Clueless novels, but never this. It was a great call." Yeah, good. I'm glad you thrilled. <laughs> yeah. and, and you know what? It see what goes around comes around again. It may be time. Yeah, oh, they made a big deal about re-releasing the Clueless movie a few years ago. Do you, do you recall that? Oh, oh, yeah, they put it on video or something, big package and everything. And when a, pro, when a project, a franchise like that comes back, you don't know what a franchise is? You know, it's like Star Trek. It's something that the studio owns and keeps milking again and again and again. Might be time to bring Clueless back, you know. Maybe I can get the cartoon show done. So let's see where are we. So that and... Seven. And we got here. So, twenty-three, twenty-four, five, twenty-six. So oh, that was clueless, huh? Well, I think. Uh, let me take a quick run through the slides here. The reason some of these things aren't coming up is some of these things are video, and I am not quite sure how to um, uh, access the video on the slideshow. They seem to be in separate files. But we're going to work this out, obviously, for uh, for the course. So I'll be able to uh, I'll be able to show you some film clips from uh, from projects I've done and all that. So um, let's see. What I want to see is how I can. I don't. Mario, is there a way I can close this screen? Oh wait, I think it's stop sharing, isn't it? Yes. Very good. Okay. Um, so at this point, oh, so uh, at this point, let's take some questions, shall we? And um, yeah, everybody, let me know. There we go. Okay. Okay. Trina Cat is typing. Let's see what she has to say. We have got some cool names here. What was that? P something and uh, Trina Cat. Yeah. You you sound like cartoon characters. Trina Cat says. I'd like it, but don't know how clueless would be received by gals who've been fed on diet of gossip girls and pretty little liars. Ah, yeah, this is interesting. Um, because uh, I was working with a student. Yeah, hold, hold, <laughs> hold it for a minute, Trini Cat. I, I'm going to answer this because this is a really good one. Um, about five years ago, I was working with a studio to do a, um, uh, to do a new Barbie project. Oh, oh, wait a minute. I was going to introduce a character... Um, to Mattel, who would be like a sister project to Barbie, and I wanted her to be this very hip, brunette, fashion, bohemian girl called Frivolity, and she'd be like a Barbie sister type character. Um, the, Mattel was very nervous about introducing anything, even within their own company, to, that they saw would compete with Barbie, but I kept you know, trying to get across them the limitations of Barbie. Um, and, at the, and then Bratz came along. And I went to the studio that created Bratz, and they had a real to-do with um, Mattel because the creator of Bratz had created it while he was there and had pitched it to Marvel, and they rejected it. And he somehow proved that, you know, I, I don't know the exact bit about this, but um, he managed to take it to another company. And yes, Bratz has really um, uh, cut into uh, Barbie and basically... Mattel lost, the, uh, Mattel lost that line of characters. They could have had them there and accessed a completely different market. Um, hmm. Yeah, uh, Xerox Ninja. You people are all cartoon characters here. 
Xerox Ninja says, well, people wouldn't want to accidentally overshadow their start. Yeah, yeah. But, but you had to build on franchises, you know, and, and expand them a bit. Um, you know, <laughs> I'm still getting used to the, the idea that the Archie Comics has a gay character. That was, you know, pretty bold of them. Yeah. Wolverstar and Mario are typing here. Yeah. Yeah. Mario sending me a chat and Wolverstar is typing. Okay. I'm envisioning what you people look like uh, with these names, you know, all like you know, capes and boots and all. Multiple attendees are typing. Oh boy. Oh, what are some good steps to start your writing career? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> as I said before, because this was really valuable for me, uh, joining organizations, going to meetings, you know, anything to get out from behind your drawing board or or your typewriter is good. Um, but. What I'm, what I'm finding now is that uh, as opposed to the route that I took, which, you know, obviously is different um, now, um, it's very good to get in on the technical end of animation, you know, being a, an artist, storyboard person or whatever, anything you can do to get into a studio in some form, in some way or another. Because once you're in there, then you have the opportunity to meet the story editors, to meet the producers, and to say, hey, I'd like to pitch to the show. I'd like to write for the show. That is the way in now. And it didn't used to be. It, it used to be um, very much, you know, I, I was at a studio where um, the producer would get very nervous if I'd go down and talk to the people in the art department. I'd say, they're drawing my stories. But now, people from the art department tend to move up, and they tend to be, uh, the, the creators and people who run shows now tend to be producer directors with the skills to animate them themselves. And uh, the, the other perk that you've noticed, you might have noticed is the producers now do voices on their own shows. So uh, that's a good way to get residuals too. Um, so Wolverstar is saying, I don't, re I don't know really what I bounced into. I clicked the link and was listening for a while, but I think this would be a great class to take. There, that's what you should be thinking. <laughs> Storyboarding and animatics, yes, are actually their own segment along with sound group. Hmm, yeah. Now, animatics, storyboarding, um, those are later. Uh, those are later portions of the development process after the original pitch bible. So, if you were to propose a, um, here, here's what a procedure would be like. Let's say you've got um, Crazy Cuckoo. You've just created Crazy Cuckoo. Okay. You would do a pitch bible. You bring that in, show that to an executive, and hopefully the executive says, I like it enough to give you a bit of development money. The slang for that is walking around money. <laughs> you know, just enough to keep you going and to keep working on the project. And that finances further development. Um, storyboards, maybe an animatic, anything that they feel that they need to commit to the project or to show to a network to get the network to commit to the project and go to production. But it's a long process. It's steps. So what you want to do is get into that process and be sure that you're making money for those steps along the way. Unless, of course, you have enough money to produce it yourself, get it up on the web, that sort of thing, and, and build it that way. At which point, hopefully, a major studio comes along and picks it up. I still can't believe this. there's going to be an Angry Birds movie. Yeah, who'd have thunk? Uh, yes, so um, Mario's, let me see, this is, oh, the chat's going by here. I, I hope I've uh, seen all this because we're rolling by pretty fast. Oh, good. Mario's giving the, uh, um, the info here for the course. There you go. Last week to apply. That's it. Mario puts three exclamation points on there. Yeah. That's as many as I allow you to use. <laughs> One exclamation point. Four. <laughs> uh, Shifa is typing. Okay. Is our time here? Oh, good. We got about fifteen minutes to go, so all of you uh, give a good think here. She says, "Type, type, typing." Ooh, multiple attendees are typing. Good. I'm running out of water here. I hope my voice is okay. Chief says, so when you're pitching a project to a client, do you have to have a good skill at presenting it? I mean, drawing it and maybe making a sample animation. Aha! When you're pitching a project to a client, the skill you need in presenting it is being able to physically pitch it like I'm doing. You see what a ham I am? <laughs> and if, because you really do have to go into a room and explain it. And then the, uh, the physical 
um, the physical pitch, whatever it might be, is what's called a leave behind, so that they can then go um, go back to it. And and any number of elements can be in there. We will get into this because as the um, as the technology is available for you to do short films on your own and recordings and and um, you know any any not and um, uh, and um, st um, uh, storyboards with storyboard programs and all that. There's any number of different ways to pitch, but there's no getting around the fact that you have to introduce yourself um, in, in, in a room. I imagine you can do this in long distance now, but in Hollywood, uh, basically, you know, people still take meetings. And if you get the meeting, you're pretty far along. And let me, uh, let me recommend this. I have found that over the years, I think the ideal pitch team is two people. One person, even if you're good at it, it's too lonely to be in a room alone, and you come out wondering what happened. Three people is too many because the pitch will tend to fall between you all. But two is really good. And one of you, if you're, if you tend to be shy or you can't pitch well, get a partner who does it. And and it gives you a thing kind of like a mountain climbing thing where you want to do well for your partner and you pull each other up. And mostly after the meeting, you can go out and together you say, "What happened in there? Did we sell it?" <laughs> yeah. So um, in that sense, I think partnerships are good. But partnerships are a serious thing. When you're uh, working um, on projects together, it's like a marriage. And if you start the project together, be prepared to, to, uh, to take it through together. Um, so Trinicat says, can you chat a little about adapting work? I've got a few short stories I'd love to work with. Very good. Um, have, they, um, have they been published? Because if you bring in anything that is, here, this, is the, this concept is pre-sold. If there's anything that has proven some success in another medium, the animation industry is, prim is primarily interested in that. That saves them the risk of putting out something that they have no idea whether it's going to hit with the public. They have some kind of idea that there's an audience for it out there. And uh, you know, with, with being able to put up uh, productions on the internet, that has changed and um, and opened up the possibility. Uh, this is also what Kickstarter is about. You know, Kickstarter shows that there are people out there who are actually willing to put money up. It's going to be interesting to see how many studios then pick up Kickstarter projects. So I, is that a good answer, Trini Cat? Yeah. Okay, I hope so. Uh, Xerox Ninja, I love that name, says, Well, I'd love to apply, but I'm currently busy with my diploma in digital media. Still a great webinar, no? Yeah, well, just keep it in mind. Sure, we're all busy, and we're all trying to put things in order. Um, <laughs> my busy thing this week was learning Adobe Connect. <laughs> Says Shifa, will you help us as well with our own stories later in the course? Well, um, what we had originally intended was a three-month course uh, in which there'd be a bit of business, there'd be a bit of animation bibles, and there'd be a, a bit of uh, and there'd be a script writing. So it breaks down like this: the goal of the script writing course is you're going to be writing a um, uh, on a um, existing character. I will probably use a Roadrunner cartoon. So you have a sample Roadrunner cartoon at the end of it. Um, animation Pitch Bibles is going to be about creating your own project. So if you have something that's really burning that you want to start getting down on paper and modeled and, and ready in presentable form, that would be uh, the one to take. So keep this clear that there's, there's two of these. Um, script Writing for Animation, is that it? Yes, yeah, Script Writing for Animation and Animation Pitch Bibles. Okay. Um, oh, wait, whoops. Um, gosh, these are flying by so much. Um, so I have something that says here, working on a project. Whoops, whoa, whoa, whoa. Everything is scrolling. <laughs> uh, my, I, I don't know. Oh, wait a minute. Let me see if I can scroll on the screen and get back to previous questions. I don't think I... Ah, here we go. Yes. Oh. Wow. Oh, okay, so I'm back to Trina Cat here. Sorry, I didn't see the scrolling thing. So I'll try and get through these quick. Trina Cat says, hmm, great reply, but I was thinking of my original works. Well, as, as I say, uh, I think that offhand the um, animation pitch Bible would be, uh, be it. Uh, let's see. Postrock, somebody is there. Okay. Oh, uh, when you're pitching an idea, ooh, it's going fast here. How do you protect your ideas? There's some sort of non disclosure agreement. Yes. Um, and by the way, that pr usually the studio has it. And the simple answer is sign it. They're not going to steal your project because they get in too much trouble for it. Uh, non-disclosure agreement means they've seen it 
and they will not disclose it to anybody else. It protects both of you. And they've realized after the uh, um, after all these years that, that that's important. But you have to also have to realize there's a lot of ideas in the air. And there are going to be things similar to you. You want to get to the point where you develop it so that it's so fully, you know, so fully fleshed out that it doesn't make sense for them to steal it and, and create it themselves. Um, I would also say it's better to go to smaller studios if you can find them. Because the problem with a place like Warner's or Disney is if you come in with an idea with funny animals or something like that, They've probably got something similar to that already. They don't need you the way a smaller studio does. Uh, Mario says, sign up for the newsletter. Oh, peace one. I've been taking so much notes. Thank you. The knowledge is much appreciated. Working on a project myself, pulling most of my time to storyboard. Well, good training. No experience writing. Listen, if you're storyboarding, you'll probably have seen what works with scripts and what doesn't. So st studying the trends of what shows today, so afraid I'm in the minority. Hey, what kind of minority? <laughs> <laughs> the nice thing is there's all sorts of niches out there now. <laughs> With a name like Peas Worm, I think you've got to be a success. Ben 10, Avatar. Hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, interesting new stuff. I wonder if any of you have seen Adventure Time. Uh, some of my students in a class I teach down here said I had to see it, and it was very impressive. Airbender. Um, sounds familiar. Overstar is typing. Yeah, this is stuff I've got to get up to speed on. I'm so busy I don't have time to see the cartoons that I should really. Yeah, yeah, Adventure Time. Yeah, Adventure Time is hilarious. I, it's indescribable. <laughs> and by the way, you know what? I, I have to say something. The best thing to write is, you know, I, I basically write things I really like to do. I don't work on, you know, very seldom have I had to work on projects where I really didn't like the characters. But um, you really have to write from your heart. And I don't see how you could write something like Adventure Time if you didn't think that way. <laughs> uh, let's see. Those types of shows aren't bought much these days unless they have a track record. Well, um, as I've been talking here, there, there is a track to sell original projects and to be the small, the small you know, creator involved. And then, of course, there's big time franchises. Now, right now, I'm in negotiations with Warner Brothers to do a uh, project. Um, that would bring together the Warner Brothers um, cartoon characters and the DC superhero characters. Now, and I think I can pull that off because I have a history with Warner Brothers and I'm doing it with um, uh, the producer and director of Animaniacs from, from uh, several years ago. So, uh, but that's their characters, you know, and that's a franchise thing. And uh, so, uh, yeah, it, it, does, it does sound big. And uh, um, I'm not afraid to tell you what the concept is because we pitched already and our pitch is that we're the best people to do this and that it's a good deal to bring in me and Byron Vaughn, who's my partner, and give us a desk and we'll, uh, uh, we'll get this to the point where Warner Brothers can produce it. Uh, the other thing is that what we found out, Warner Brothers produces a line of direct-to-video movies. They do a lot of stuff with the superheroes. You know, there's always a Batman animated movie coming out. So they need things that go into slots. So this is another thing. If you're pitching to a studio or a network, find out what they need and see if, you, if it slots in. And don't waste your time taking something someplace where they've got no place for it, they're not interested in it. Yeah. Are you afraid? <laughs> Am I afraid? No. Uh, I'll tell you what I'm afraid of. It's interesting. Um, at this point, we've been in email contact with the executive. We haven't been able to get in touch with him, probably because it's Christmas and he's busy and all that. And I have to pick up the phone early next week. I'll do it, you know. But email has created an interesting thing where it's harder to decide, you know, the time when you pick up the phone and actually try to talk to somebody, you know, because people kind of hide behind email. And uh, I, I, email's good for some things, bad for others. Yeah. Um, all the info here. How many pages is the average comic book? Uh, let me see. Um, well, I've got one right here. Hold on. Here's my uh, Daffy Duck Looney Tunes book, right? You're lucky it happened to be in, in the corner here. Uh, this one is um, 32 pages, but uh, graphic novels uh, range differently. But this is um, uh, this is the standard, um, uh, you know, newsstand um, comic. Yeah. Uh, let's see. We got more questions coming here. Yeah, Shifa is typing. How do you keep writing relevant appeal and changing taste without losing the essence, heart of your story or style? Boy, that's a good one. And um, that is an issue. You know, I, 
I'm I don't try to hide my age and experience and all that. I you know I can't pretend I am anything I, am, I but I what I am. Um, so you know I market myself particularly with the older franchises as being the one who's experienced with these characters. And I have no problem working with younger people if it's uh, you know if it's applicable to a project. So that's one way to do it. And I, I work with younger creators on projects, and that helps. And this I found helps in pitches. Sometimes I've gone in pitches with some wild young character, you know, and they I can see them looking at them and saying, God, how are we going to control this nut? And then they look at me and say, well, Jack's got a nice jacket on and, you know, glasses and everything, and he's got gray hair. So maybe he'll be the control factor here. So you kind of team yourself so that... Um, uh, so that it, it works that way. You know, like aging male movie stars with increasingly younger uh, female leads. You've seen that, haven't you? <laughs> Let's see. But uh, Trina Cat, that's a very good question. Uh, we'll go into it. Yeah, <laughs> we had another hour. Oh, we got about five minutes here. Ochnerd. Hey, <laughs> what's your costume like, Ochnerd? Trina Cat. And Ochnerd says, how long does it take to make a comic book? Um, well, I told you how long it took me to write the stories. As for the process, um, a, a comic book will come, I hope this answers it, sort of. Um, the comic book itself is usually published three to six months after I get a story in. So as I said, the nice thing was I had the, the chance to forget about what I was written, what, what I'd written, and uh, kind of enjoy it when, uh, uh, when it came up again. Mario is typing here. Yeah, isn't that a good question? I'm going to... Um, We'll we'll take some time in class for that, and um, you know there's no one answer to it. But um, yeah, you know what? I I think maybe this is a question. A train of cat. I'm going to try and end it with this. I think because we're up to our time here. But um, that's a good question of character. Um, I think that as a personality, you know, as a human being, you want to get out and be relevant, and you don't want to be a stick in the mud. So, you know, I mean, what's the point of being in a youth-oriented business if you can't enjoy the idea of um, new ideas and things? There are some things I don't like. Um, you know, I, I, I really don't care for South Park. I think it's really vulgar, and uh, it, it's a brilliant show, but it helped to kill the kind of cartoons I like, you know, uh, Looney Tunes and such. They were a little more elegant. However, seeing something like Adventure Time, it's brilliant. It's funny, and, um, you know, I love that. I'd love to work on that show. So, um, what do we think? Is everybody satisfied enough that uh, we can close up here? We're uh, going on uh, the noon hour. Shifa is typing, and let's see what she has to say. I'm assuming, Shifa, you are a she. Okay. See. Are you also going to do this course sometime later? Yes, and um, what I also hope is that uh, we can get a three-month course going that, as I, I say, would incorporate everything. That would be writing for animation, and we'd get into the business more. Um, do both Bibles and um, um, script writing, okay? And Wilbur starts to it was great. Thanks for your time. Uh, this is a pleasure. I'm just so glad that I was not worried about talking to you because, you know, I love working with students and, you know, this comes easily off the top of my head, but I was worried that the technology worked and, uh, hey, Mario. <laughs> Good. You got it. Okay, multiple attendees are typing. Great stuff, da-da-da-da. Okay. Excellent, great. And I got to tell you, it's December and it's a beautiful day in Los Angeles. I'm going outside. <laughs> okay, I'm going to uh, exit if that's okay. All right. Uh, Mario, I'll be in touch uh, later and we'll uh, go over what's happened here and uh, get more prepared, okay? All right. Thanks for coming. Okay.